So over here in John chapter 4, there was a special appointment. Just as there is one here today. I don't know too much about it, but I know that much about it. I think often uh, the disciples didn't know much about what God was doing and how he was doing it. And even Christ at times said that he didn't fully know what the Father was doing. And I, being in the ministry, find myself in the same situation. That I know sometimes God is doing something and he's calling me to do something and he, he doesn't give me all the details but uh, he gives me enough to know what to do. In fact, my own mom's testimony, after she had just had me, she had hit the end of a rope. You can just imagine, right? You know, you know what did it. If you want to know what, what it was that put my mom over the edge, she had just had me, and I was her newest little and fourth baby. And, uh, but uh, she didn't know what to do, and she went down to a church, a local church, and and she went in the door, and uh, the pastor in his office said, Well, there you are. I've been trying to leave for a couple hours now, and I can't figure out why. She said, Well, what, what do you mean? He said, Well, he said, I keep on getting my stuff together and trying to leave. And God says, No, and sit down. <laughs> and so, and so uh, he asked her in so many ways, How long have you been a Christian? And she said, Well, I've been a Christian all my life. I grew up going to church. And he said, Well, you know. In the words of Billy Sunday, going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than being in a garage makes you a car. Right? And, uh, and she came to believe then, at that time, because God had an appointment for her. And he held that minister there that day. So she could believe. And we read through this is very much the same way. John chapter 4, it says in the beginning there, that um, when therefore the Lord knew that the Pharisee had heard that he, Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, he left Judea and departed into, again into Galilee. Now Jesus was there, and the Pharisees had caught wind of him. They didn't care for him too much. They didn't care for John the Baptist too much. And uh, <clears throat> they heard that he was a bigger hit than John, which really cramped their style, because they wanted the people to follow them. And that he was baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were. You know, one thing we've got to understand as the church is that Jesus didn't come on the scene to be this sole figure superhero like a Thor or Superman or the kind of people we create, but God wants to use his church. And for whatever reason, you know, the application there is that that means that we need to get busy, that he intends for us to participate in his work. And we have to find our place in some way and what we are doing in that. Could Jesus have baptized all of those people? And so I'm convinced God can do anything. But for whatever reason, he did not want them to do that. And you go all through the Gospels and you find out that he was looking for places and, and little opportunities of service for his disciples to serve him. Hey, go pick up this colt that's never been ridden. Hey, Peter, go down to the shore and cast a line in and get that coin out of that fish's mouth. Hey, y'all go and get some food. You know, do this, you know, do that. Here's your part. Here's the way you can serve. Go and go by twos and, and share the good news. And, and he sent them out. Hey, here, baptize these people as I preach and they come. I want you to participate. I can recall taking my little girls since they were two years old. They've been going out to job sites with me. And we would get out there, and honestly, there is nothing a two- or three-year-old can do on a job site that is beneficial to me. It's just not possible. And I would intentionally leave all my, you know, framing drops, my wood drops and junk piled down there, and, 
you know, here, and I'd give them a job. It was a fake job, but it was a job. You know, and they would go and say, look, this is your job. You, you pick up these blocks of wood and you throw them in that bucket. And it wasn't because I, I didn't need their help. But it was an opportunity and a beginning of a fellowship that I could have with them. It began training them. And it already began blessing me. My little child, my little girl is, is working with me and she's having a part in this with me, a fellowship in this with me. Now, and I'll tell you the truth, now Reagan is more beneficial to me than some you know, young men that come along and try to help. And, you know, there's some days I'm like, well, Reagan, wrap up school, you know, and come to work with me. And she'll go to work, and, and she's learned and developed, and, and she's beneficial to me now. And we've got to remember that God doesn't want to use a superhero. We, so often we look at men like uh, Billy Graham or Joe Fote or somebody like that, and, and we think of uh, Greg Laurie, and, oh, well, you know, he's going to save the moment. Hey, God doesn't want to use single men superheroes. He wants to use his church. And that's the way he has always done it. He gave us the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God into salvation, right? To everyone who believes. And then he gave us his gospel. He gave us a participation, a place in his kingdom, a job to do. The, the scripture says that he gives to each one, the spirit gives to each one a gift, you know, according to the spirit's will for the edification of the church. That means that, um, you know, you're not so important that you don't need a job, and you're not so insignificant that you can't have a job, that he has a place for you to serve, and that is the attention that he had. He doesn't want us to be mindless observers. He wants us to be participant. And he got his disciples to baptize instead of himself. And he left Judea and departed to, and again into Galilee, uh, Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. I love old King James. It says, and I must, must needs go through Samaria. I don't know. You know, I guess it made perfect sense a couple hundred years ago. Must needs go through Samaria. But those are the words I have in my mind. Now, it was not the most ideal route to go through Samaria. I think most of us know this for two, two reasons. There was a physical reason and there was a cultural reason. Uh, the Samaritans came out of the result of the Assyrian exile that happened in 721 B.C. If y'all remember, the Assyrians came, they took Israel into exile, 721, and, and they went through and they took all the best, the brightest, the strongest, and best-looking and people and took them away into captivity. They left the more undesirable people behind. And then to make the situation worse, there were Assyrians and foreigners that came in and that intermarried and, you know, with the Jews that were there. And so to the Jews, they were no longer a pure people. And so there was a great deal of racism between the Samaritans and the Jews. The Jews hated the Samaritans, and for the most part, the Samaritans returned the favor. You know, and, and they just didn't like each other. We don't have that trouble anymore in the world today, right? But uh, they just didn't like each other. And so typically a Jew was like, oh, no, I'm not driving through the... I have to confess, I'm, I'm guilty too. I, I, I'll drive 40 miles to go out of my way to go around Austin, Texas, or Houston. I mean, you get there and I'm like, no, I know what Beltway 8 looks like. I will go, you know, whatever. I'll get on a ship and go through the Caribbean to get over to Florida, but I'm not driving through Houston, right? So there's a physical reason that it is not convenient to walk across Samaria. There's mountains. You know, if you go back and... You read about where, where they ended up, Shechem, you know, the Oaks of Mamre, where we read about uh, Abram, where he was a little while ago. It's mountainous. It's rugged. It's dry, you know. Uh, along the way, you can say hi to a scorpion and sit on a cactus. You know, it's not, it's not wonderful. But there's a cultural reason why it wasn't convenient. There was a physical reason why it wasn't convenient. And Jesus came along, and you can only imagine what his disciples said, like, Jesus, you know. Now we can go down there along the Jordan, and there's a nice, smooth path, and it goes like this and not like this. You know, don't you know that that's easier? And besides that, we don't have to go through Houston. You know, we don't have to go through, you know, Samaria. I'm sorry if anybody's from Houston. I mean, I don't mean to point out the fact that that's the worst place in Texas, but um, 
you know, it, it's just not desirable. But guess what? You know, that is ministry. That is, that is part of ministry. If you want to have a part in what he's doing, you've got to be willing and ready for it to be inconvenient. You know, and Jesus never had a problem with that, did he? He just did not have a problem. You know, can you can imagine what it was like when they came to him and, hey, uh, Jesus, your friend, Lazarus, is dead. Well, let me hang out for a few days. Can you imagine what we would be like? Like, that would be the most uncomfortable three days. But, but Jesus so willingly, so readily conformed to the Father's will, and he's like, okay, this is part of it. I'm going through Samaria. Did Jesus perfectly know at the time why? I don't know. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. But he went through Samaria. Perhaps God, you know, the Father revealed it to him as he went and what it was about. But, you know, there is no logical, rational, practical reason why he would go through Samaria. No, there is a spiritual reason, and that's it. When it said that he needed to go through Samaria, you can rest assured that it was a spiritual reason that he needed to go through Samaria. Verse 5, so he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well, and it was about the sixth hour. It was about 12 o'clock noon, in other words. And uh, plenty hot and uncomfortable. And, And all those same things, and all the same things that we have to go through and complain about that Jesus went through, he just didn't complain about them. You know that? Yeah, it was hot. He walked through hot air and he, you know, got blisters on his feet just the same way that we do. And he suffered and, you know, he says in every way he was tempted as we are. Yet without sin is what it says about him. But he was traveling through there. He was tired. He sat on Jacob's well. Now this is, this is that place. This is the place we just read about where Abraham was living, you know, by the Oaks of Mamre. It's also called Shechem, Shoulders. That it's the place that, that is between these two big mountains. Maybe, maybe it was like a reference to the 80s and the mountains were shoulder pads. And that's why they called it shoulders. I don't know. But it was Shechem in the center. And it was Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. And you remember Ebal was the mountain on which that, that Joshua wrote a, a copy of the law. You know, on there. And that was the mountain of cursing. And, and Mount Gerizim was the mountain of blessing. And, that's where they were. That's the same place that Jacob dug this well. And very much a historical place. This is the place that we call today the West Bank. You know, it is a violent place. It's a rough place. And it has been for a great amount of time. But he was there. He came. He was weary. He sat on the well. It was 12 o'clock in, in the afternoon, midday. And there came, verse 7, And there came a woman of Samaria to draw water. And Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Verse 8, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. I wonder what it would be like and how different we would be. I know we have that little cliche saying, what would Jesus do? But sometimes I wonder if we shouldn't say, what wouldn't Jesus do? How <laughs> Yeah, I wonder sometimes, why doesn't God give us more power? I can only imagine how we would want to abuse it. I think the power he's given me financially and how often I want to abuse that. And the power that he's given me uh, in regards to my freedom and how at times I want to abuse that. And the, and the power that he's given me in terms of time and how I want to abuse that, I can only imagine if he gave me more power. Now this Jesus who is able to get a fish to spit out a copper coin and to sit on a, a little colt that had never been written, ridden and was able to feed thousands with a few loaves and fish, uh, you know, that he was able to do all these things at the moment of need, yet you find in his life he was so practical that he was walking along weary. And in the, in the middle of the day, and he needed a drink. Be like, well, Jesus, why don't you just snap your fingers and... Boom, here's a drink. You know, let there be a bottle of water. I mean, you created the heavens and the earth. It says all things were created by him and for him. But you know, a remarkable thing about Christ 
is not that the power that he hadn't used, but the power that he had that he did not use. To me, that is more remarkable that in every moment, at every time in his life, even when he told him, listen, do you not know that I could call legions of angels to my rescue? That he did not just have the ability to use power to do something. He had the character to have power and not use it for his own purpose. That's remarkable. That he said, only as the Father leads me, right? Only as according to the will of God. He said, that's my bread, that's my food, to do the will of God. And the things that he went through, you know, we would want to be snapping our fingers left and right. I'm tired, I don't want to be tired, you know? I have to walk, I don't want to walk. I'm thirsty, let there be water. I'm food, let me have food instantly. And, and gratification and looking from point A to point B and how we want every. That's how our prayer life goes. God saw my financial troubles, saw my physical troubles, you know, answer every question, fill every need, you know, and, and put it all together in place. James warns us about that. He says, we ask and we receive not because we, we want to spend it on our own lusts. That according to our prayer and, we, and when we pray, we're so focused on our will and our desires and our concerns and our needs, we, we forget that the fact of prayer is rather to conform our will into God. You know, and the, and the fact of confession is to bring what we say into the likeness of what he says, to, to say the same, to homo legeo, is the Greek words of it. But I think it is remarkable that Jesus Christ that he had all the power available to him, and yet he walked and travailed and was wearied and subjected himself to the service of people. You can only imagine how incompetent we must have been towards him. And in fact, a few times he said, how long shall I you know, endure with you folks? And, and he said to this lady, give me a drink. Now I'll tell you the truth, he didn't need a drink from her. But she needed to give him a drink. He didn't need, he didn't need her to give him a drink, but she needed her to give him a drink. He asked her to give me a drink, and his disciples had gone in the city to buy food. Now the Samaritan woman therefore said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink since I'm a Samaritan woman? For the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Now you see, this isn't just uh, you know, supposedly and, and uh, whatever good preaching. They really didn't have much dealings with Samaritans. You remember the, the illustration, the parable that Jesus gave about the good Samaritan and how... You know, a, a scribe and a Pharisee came along and didn't help the stranger. But a Samaritan came along. Well, there's a reason why he picked a Samaritan. As he knew there would automatically be a dislike for that person. And, and she was surprised in herself for two reasons. Number one, she was a Samaritan. Number two, she was a woman. And that, you know, typically, especially a rabbi, a, a scribe or a Pharisee, would not even acknowledge women in public. Back then, as they would walk along and, you know, as if a woman were even to say hi, they'd be like, I'm not talking to you. I'm not acknowledging you. And Jesus, being a teacher, they probably would have expected him to do the same thing. But he didn't do the same thing. He wasn't like them. And if you're not sure about that, you read later on, when they came back, they were surprised he was talking to a woman. He's talking to a woman. You know, that's strange. Still, there's cultures today that... Uh, I told Jennifer, you know, my second trip to India. I said, oh, I said, well, you know, I can't remember what it was. I said, I'll, I'll uh, I said, because I told her, I said, well, all the young, you know, all the young ones will want to come and, and take selfies. And she's like, I don't want to hear about it. I said, no, 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 not the young girls, babe, all the boys. The young men want to come and take selfies. The, the, the ladies won't talk to me. You know, in India, you know, you walk by a lady, she's like this, you know. I don't see you, I don't, you know, don't talk to me, I don't want to talk to you, and, oh, but, you know, the, the, the teenage boys and the young boys will come, and, hey, can I take a selfie, can we take a selfie, you know, and, and, and they're all interested, and they want to interact, and all those things, and, but in the same way, it was very awkward for Jesus to talk to a woman. It was very awkward for Jesus to, to speak to a Samaritan, and she did not know how to take it. Perhaps she might have had a a little bit of a snarl in this. Now think about this. This is interesting. And the dynamic that we see here, you know, if you remember John chapter 3, one chapter ago, there was Nicodemus. Now Nicodemus 
had piety. He was very religious. He was a teacher. And in that situation, there was Nicodemus that had piety, and now here's this immoral woman that has promiscuity. Both objects of ministry from Christ. Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. You know, this immoral woman who encountered Jesus in the, in the middle of the day. You know, Nicodemus came with contemplation. You know, what do you have to do to be, to be saved? And this woman, she defended in debate. So I say that to, you know, get it out of your head that evangelism has any remote formula to it at all. Evangelism is as random as people are. It is as different and random and unique as you can find individual people, and you'll lead a thousand people to Christ in a thousand different ways. You know, but we still we try to formulate it, don't we? We try to sit down, and I know for good cause, you know, we go through this little how to lead somebody to Christ, but listen, you better had, had get past that and beyond that and look at that person and know who they are and be like Paul that says, I become all things to all men that I might win some. I think Jesus is the greatest example of that. Nicodemus, a pious religious ruler that came to him by night in contemplation, and now here he is just a few days later, and here's an immoral woman in the middle of the day that wants to debate religion with him in a fiery way. <laughs> Jesus was ministered to them both. And as she said, how is it that you talk to me? In verse 10, and Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God... And who it is that says to you, give me a drink? You would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Now, she got it right that he was a Jew, but he just wasn't any Jew, was he? He was the Messiah. And I believe that Jesus knew that there was something in this woman that was more than just a glass of water, that was more than just a random woman. I think Jesus could recognize the opportunity. This is it. This is why I had to go through Samaria. You know, when, when he delayed for Lazarus, and he said, well, this is why I had to delay, you know, that the glory of God might be amplified or magnified or increased. And he was so mindful to see that, to realize that, and he told her, listen, if you understood who it was that you were talking to, you'd be asking me. And she said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with, and a well that is, and the well is deep. And where do you get that living water? In fact, the well is 150 feet deep. If you were to go over there, it's still perfectly intact. And there, I think, I think oh, Jack's not here, but uh, Mac's not here, but he, he was there not too long ago. Anybody been to the, this well, Jacob's well? 150 feet deep, uh, it's still there today, and she wants to know, how are you going to draw that water? And she said, you're not greater than our father Jacob, are you? who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle. Now, she still called Jacob her father, and indeed there was some ethnicity and some, some lineage there. But the Samaritans had branched off religiously from the Jews, in that they still accepted the, the Pentateuch, right, the first five books of the Bible. They, they kind of tweaked them a little bit. You know, they went Thomas Jefferson on them, you know, they, take the Bible and rewrite it a little bit. You know. So they, they said that the Garden of Eden was on Mount Gerizim, that um, Noah's Ark, guess, well, guess where it landed? They said it landed on Mount Gerizim, right? You know, and, so, and then so they were kind of redirected everything to that mountain, and that mountain was the place of worship for them, and that was the place where she went in her head. And, and she wanted to know, well, how do you compare to Jacob? Are you, gonna, are you greater than him? Can you... Pull this water out of here, and why are you talking to me? In verse 13, Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water shall thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water I shall give him shall become a well of water, springing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, so that I will not be thirsty, nor come all the way here to draw. Now, she was carnally minded, just like Nicodemus. Isn't that funny? So Two people so different. So dramatically different, but spiritually the same. I mean, Nicodemus, if you put these two people together, they would be day and night, wouldn't they? Remember what Nicodemus thought? You must be born again. You know where his mind was? 
how can I go back into my mother and be born again? He was carnally minded. He was thinking in, in earthly terms, in physical terms, in intellectual terms, not in spiritual terms. Guess what this woman was thinking? Physical terms, carnally. And, you know, that's the only way by nature that we think. And so God constantly, constantly uses examples for us. He gives us physical, carnal examples in order for us to see a spiritual concept. That's what every par- parable is. That's what every time in the con- in fact, that is what every miraculous healing of Christ is. It is a carnal, physical example of a, of a spiritual need and provision of God. Why were there so many healings to, to try to get it into our mind what it is and, and what he was doing and what he really meant? Now when he healed the paralytic, I mean, the greatest desire in, in, in the mind of Christ was not that the paralytic that should walk, but that people should realize that spiritually he can heal as well. When he made provisions that spiritually he can provide as well. You know, in trying to speak to this woman, I'm talking about something else. I'm talking about a water that if you drink of it, you'll never thirst again. He's talking spiritually. She's thinking carnally. I got a good question for you. What what water are you drinking these days? How often do you have to drink it, right? <laughs> you, know, you ever have chap lips? And the interesting thing about chap lips is that you can lick chap lips and they feel good for about 10 seconds, don't they? And then they're chapped again. And they're not satisfying, are they? You know, it's, it's, not, it's just something over and over and we have to come back to again and again, and we go to these things, and listen, we come up with all kinds of water sources to drink to try to fulfill this need. It doesn't matter if you're saved or not saved. We, you know, we come to the point where we might come to the fountain of Christ and drink and be saved, and then over the years we kind of drift away. We lose our first love, like that church of Ephesus, and we can find ourselves, you know, watching hours, dedicating hours and hours of our life to television or internet, trying to be satisfied, trying to entertain ourselves. We might devote our lives to a career, trying to be satisfied. There's in, you know, endless things that we, water and cups that we're trying to drink, they're trying to fill up our life, trying to do this very thing, this well of, e- of water springing up into eternal life, this satisfaction that Christ is talking about. What are we drinking today? Now, I don't mean to put you on the spot. I just ask you because I happen to be an expert in all manner of backsliding and stubbornness. You know, you can come to me and I can tell you all about it. I'm a, I'm a pro. I've done it a hundred different ways, a hundred different times. That I find myself trying to satisfy my life in ways other than Christ. And I don't know about you, but so far I'm 10 for 10, 100%. I fail in satisfaction apart from Christ. It just doesn't do it. You know, and you find yourself, you know, striving and, and working so hard to try to do what Christ can do so easily. And she wanted that water. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, so that I will not be thirsty nor come all the way here to draw. Now there's a great provision made by God. And it is available to us all. I'll tell you the truth, that that there's a hindrance between us and him. There is something that stands between us and God. There is something in the way. Now, she wanted this satisfying water. Jesus wanted to give it to her. But there was something in the way. He said in verse 16, he said, well, just do this. He said to her, go call your husband and come here. Verse 17, the woman answered and said to him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, well, have you said, I have no husband? <laughs> Good job. You, <laughs> you said that well, but you know, here's the reality of it. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you have now is not your husband. This you have said truly. Now, obviously, this was part of this woman's problem. This was something that stood in her way of receiving that water 
of receiving that provision of God. You know, and it's the easiest way I can put it is sin. Is sin that evidently this woman, now I'm sure you could find a situation where you know, a woman was married and her husband died and she remarried and her husband died and she remarried and her husband died and maybe the fourth husband, you know, committed adultery and she biblically got divorced and, you know, but that, that wasn't the situation here, was it? He said, you, you've had five husbands and not only that, to make sure we're, we're clear about this woman's, you know, values and ideas, he said, and the man you have now is not your husband. Now I'll say this just to clear up a, a question we have today in our culture. If, if you just live with somebody, does that make them your spouse? That's what people want to say. Well, I mean, we're, I mean, we're practically married. We might as well be married. We're common law married. We, you know, we have that. I don't, you know, so what, evidently, there's something that you can have like that that's not real marriage because the Bible talks about it here. He said, yeah, you know, you, you have this man. You live with him. You, you, know, you do other things with him, but he's not your husband. He must be something else. You know, in other words, yeah, a shack up is a real thing. Living in sin is a real thing. Fornication, yeah, is a real thing, and it's not biblical. And obviously Christ was unapproving of whatever her situation was in, in living with this man in that way. And, you know, you know why his biggest problem with it is? is she's been cheated. She's been ripped off. Just like anybody else caught in sin, that, you know, the devil promises big wages, but he pays the counterfeit money, doesn't he? Isn't that the way it works? He, I mean, he promises wonderful wages and benefits, and it'll be so satisfying and wonderful, and then he, he writes you a fake check, or he gives you counterfeit cash. And it turns out not to be all that was promised. And not to be, and you can imagine the disappointment. I, I know people personally that have been married five times. They are not full of joy. And, you know, and they, the frustration of life and going from one broken relationship to another broken relationship and, and actually breaking that relationship before they begin the new relationship and how, you know, the, the next husband tends to start an adulterous affair, you know, with, uh, against the last husband. Hey, there's nothing good about that. And this was the thing for her own personal self. Now, according to their need, what, what was Nicodemus? Listen, you need to be born again. We need to deal with, with this situation. And, and uh, here, for this lady, it was this promiscuity. This effort of hers to try to find some kind of fulfillment in a relationship. And when that relationship proved to be unfulfilling, well, she's looking for another relationship. And when that one proved to be unfulfilling, she's looking for another one. For the rich young ruler, do you remember what it was? Well, you know, what must I do? And Jesus just put his finger on the spot. He said, well, just go sell all your junk and come and follow me. Well, he really said all your riches, but really what Jesus meant was go sell all that junk and, and come and follow me. And that was something between him and God. That was a problem. That was something he was unwilling to let go of. And he said, and go, go call your husband. And he said, well, have you said you have no husband? You've had five husbands. And the one you have now is not your husband. This you have said truly. Verse 19, the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and the people, I'm sorry, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And he said, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming, neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem shall you worship the Father. And, you know, this was, uh, have you all ever asked somebody if they're a Christian and they, explain to you what denomination they grew up in. Isn't that awkward? Hey, do you know Christ? Have you ever been saved? Do you ever give your life to Christ? Well, I grew up in the Methodist church. I grew up in the Baptist church. I grew up in the Presbyterian church. I went through confirmation when I was 14. Or, or what are you like, well, what in the world does that have to do with anything? But that's where people go. And, and I mean, with all understanding and, and gentleness, not in terms of criticism, but just ignorance, not knowing. Hey, you know, that as far as they know, Jesus is a participation in a, in a local social group, a denomination. I go down to this church, I go down to, to that church. I don't know if y'all heard about the, the two people arguing about denomination, right? The, the Lutheran asked the Presbyterian, you know, why do you go to the Presbyterian church? Presbyterian said, well, I, my father went to the Presbyterian church and 
my grandpa went to the Presbyterian church. So Lutheran said, well, what if your father and your grandfather were fools? So, well, I guess I'd be a Lutheran then, you know? You know? So, <laughs> but, you know, and whatever denomination, I'm not trying to pick on anybody. You know, whatever, you tell it on your own denomination, whatever, I, you know, it doesn't matter. But, but uh, to argue denomination, the problem was that this woman needed a relationship with God, and she was so confused about how, you know, what, what water is this? Is it out of this well? Can you get the water? You know, what do I need to know? No, not something physical. Not, not that, you know, and she said, well, you must be a prophet. Where's the right place? No, not a, not a physical location either. You know, this whole portion of Scripture really talks about worship. Talks about a worship relationship with God. And that's the very thing that it comes down to. That's the point that Jesus comes to. And in verse 21, he says, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem shall you worship the Father. Now, first of all, if you're going to have a real worship, you've got to have the right person. There's no such thing as real worship with the wrong person, with a, with a fake person. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. John kind of gave us a little you know, introduction to that in the previous chapter. John the Baptist, when he said, you know, that, listen, he said, I'm from below and he's from above and he's higher than me and, and he is the one that needs the glory and that's only fitting. I talked about last Sunday about what if I started watering that fake plant? You say, well, that's silly. That's ridiculous. It's a fake plant. Well, what if we worship a fake God? That's silly, right? You know, you're trying to water a fake plant. It doesn't work. You're trying to honor something that's not honorable. It wasn't too long ago in the UK. A burglar was breaking into a home. And the burglar got killed with a knife in self-defense. You know, the homeowner killed the intruder with a knife. And the people, uh, in general, begin to mourn for this burglar, for this criminal, and they, and they set up a, a memorial on the victim, on the homeowner's fence. And people came and they grieved for this criminal that had been killed, and how, I know you all have seen the videos here, you know, when criminals get shot, and, oh, well, he was such a bright young boy that loved school, and... Well, at what point does a bright young boy that loves school start breaking into people's homes at night? Right? It's like, how does this work? And other people protested and they went and they tore down the things that are memorial and rightly so because why is it right that a criminal should be honored? It's, no, that's not right. And, you know, it's amazing though the perversions that this. Y'all know what they just voted on in Washington State? That this really went to vote. That. In the moment of crisis, a police officer would have to render aid to the injured criminal before the injured victim. How does he know? It's that? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a NASA employee, not a rocket scientist, but when a policeman rolls up on a situation and there's an injured criminal and there's an injured victim, who should get aid first? Well, Washington State suggested that the criminal should get aid first. I, what in the world are you thinking? You know, that's not right. That's not appropriate. That's not proper. Well, that's about as improper as worshiping a false god. That's about as improper, improper as worshiping a false person of God. And how hard is it to make a false person of God? The second commandment says, Thou shalt not make unto thyself a graven image. Now, I know we would never think we would do that. But if we take just one step away from the Bible and we say, We well, you know, I kind of think God is like this. Well, be careful. Put up that hammer and put up that chisel and make sure that, you, that you're not shaping out the God that you want to be. Put those things away and read your Bible and ask Him, God, you show me who you are. And I don't want to make up in my mind how you are and what I think you are and what I want you to be. He said, first of all, he said, you've got to have the right person that you shall worship the Father. Now, this Father is a very distinctive Father. I, I think it was a few weeks ago I talked about, you know, uh, doing this very thing and making God out to be somebody who's not. 
You know, and if we step away from Scripture, if we step away from the Bible, and everybody creates in their own mind something that they think God is, guess what? We'll come out with a thousand different versions of God, won't we? But listen, there's only one God, and He's defined in Scripture, and He's made very clear, and He said to her, well, listen, you've got to have the right person. And not only the right person, he says, then there's the right place. He said, neither in this mountain nor in the other. Now, the two mountains were Mount Zion and Mount Gerizim, right? Mount Gerizim was the one that the Samaritans had put there. In fact, Alexander the Great gave them permission to build a temple up there. You know, he came through, and he didn't really cause too much trouble there, and they were very submissive, and he, you know, gave them a little favor, and he said, sure. You know, y'all go build your temple up there, no problem. And so there was Mount Zion, right? And then in, down in Judea, and that's where they worshiped, the Jews worshiped. And there was this other mountain, Mount Gerizim, and she's like, what, 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 what do I need? I've got, I've got this sin problem in my life. I need worship. I need to, to make amends with God. Do I need to go here? Do I need to go there? He said, no, no, no. You need the right person. And guess where the right place is? He said in this way, he said, you shall worship. He said, you worship that which you do not know. We worship that which we know for salvation is of the Jews. He said, verse 23, but the hour is coming, and now is when true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the fathers, for such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. Now, Jesus said, listen, it's not in that mountain, it's not in the other mountain. Ultimately, it's right here. Now, we make a little mistake oftentimes that, and I know it's not what we mean, and it's tit for tat, but we call this place the sanctuary, right? Oh, it's in the sanctuary. We're in the... We're in the sanctuary. Well, this is no more a sanctuary than the local diamond shamrock is down the road. Or well, It's dating me. We don't have diamond shamrocks anymore, do we? Then what, whatever, the racetrack down the road. This place is no more a sanctuary than that. This is just a, a building. It has sheetrock. It has, you know, uh, concrete floors, a carpet laid over them. It's got a shingle roof on it. And you can go and uh, find a thousand different buildings just like that. Paul made it clear on Mars Hill, didn't he? Acts chapter 17, he said that God does not dwell in temples made with hands. He doesn't. You know, there's only one kind of temple on the earth today. It's flesh and blood temple. I think it's 1 Corinthians chapter 6, maybe verse 19. He says, what, do you not know that your body is the temple of God? It's the temple of the Holy Spirit whom you have from God. That it's your body, that, that it is you in which he resides. And listen, we don't, listen, we don't come here to worship. We bring our worship here. We don't come here because the Spirit of God is here. The Spirit of God is here because we come here. The only Spirit of God that we can have in this building is what you and I bring along with us. Because there's nothing special about this building that, that he would reside here. He'd be really lonely most of the week, wouldn't he? He'd be all alone. And, and, but, but he resides in us is what he, where he resides. If we go over to, um, I can't remember all of it, Hebrews, I turned right to it. How about that? Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews 10, 19. How about that? says it in this way. It says, since therefore, brethren, we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh. You, you all know what he's talking about when they, when they built the temple? And in the back of the temple was the holy place. And in the back of the holy place was the holy of holies, or the holiest. And that was the place where the ark was, that was the place where the Shekinah glory of God was. And once a year, a priest would go in there with a basin of blood to make atonement, and they tied a rope around his ankle in case things didn't go right. You'd pull Billy back out of there, right? And you know, nobody else would go in there. You'd, you know, you'd have to draw straws to go in there, and everybody kept cutting theirs off. You know, I was like, I'm not going in there. And they would go in there that one time. Well, guess what? Y'all remember? You know, y'all know what happened? There was the veil that, hang over, that hung over the Holy of Holies. This veil was six inches thick. That's how thick that thing was. It, it weighed a tremendous amount. It was, it was made of of white, blue, red, and royal purple colors. If you think about all those, the, the white showed his purity, the blue showed his divinity, the, 
The red shows his humanity and his shed blood. And guess what? If you mix that blue and that red together, you get purple. And that showed this, the hypostatic union, right? That, that unique person that Christ was, fully God and fully man. And, and that was likened to his body. And when he hung there on the cross and was crucified, that that veil was torn from the top and to the bottom. And, and what nobody could look in and see for years and years now was torn wide open and made open. And at that point, well, it was no longer in that little holy of holies that was the sanctified sanctuary temple of the Spirit of God, but rather, listen, it was us. And he said, I'll put my Spirit in you. And he said, you shall be my witnesses when, you, when my Spirit comes upon you, is what he said. And if we really want to get it right, listen, the right person is the Father. Yes, he seeketh he seek such to worship him. Listen, the right place, listen, it's not just this building. We come here and worship, and yeah, rightfully so, but listen, we, you know, the right place to worship is everywhere we go. Every place is holy. Y'all remember when they came into the presence, when, when Joshua and Moses, they, they came into the presence of God, and he said, hey, take your shoes off. This, this place is holy. <laughs> and we have to walk around in a holy place all the time. In his presence all the time. You know, in every way and in every place that we go and, and you think about it, we come into this building and we wouldn't profane it. We wouldn't, you know, there's things that we wouldn't say in this building that we go out and speak right in the temple of God out in the parking lot. Or maybe driving down I-20, probably driving down I-20 is really where we defile the temple the most, you know. And do, do things that, you know, that we wouldn't do in here because we have this idea that this is where God resides, that this is his holy place. No, that's his holy place. To be in you, and he said, no, not in this mountain, not in that mountain. He said, you're going to be a true worshiper. Listen, but the thing was, in spirit and in truth. Now, we find this, this has been around for a lot of years, and the Samaritans were, I mean, they were some zealous, very active, uh, charismatic worshipers. And charisma is not a bad thing. You know, I personally love to go into worship in India because, you know, they fire up worship in India and it's loud and there's three or four people with a tambourine, there's three or four people with drums and it's a little obnoxious and a little loud, but listen, it has zeal and it has emotion and it has excitement. And the struggle we have so often over there is that they're worshiping and they're excited and they're busy and they're loud, but they're not too sure exactly what about. Over here, we have people that have read the Bible from front to back. They can sit down and delineate any you know, doctrine out of Scripture from you. And they sit in church and you, know, you wonder sometimes, like, do they have a pulse? I better take old Fred's pulse. He might be dead. And the difference that was between the Samaritans and the Judeans, that the Samaritans had zeal, but he said, listen, you don't know what you're worshiping. you changed the word of God. you perverted the word of God. You're ignorant. You don't really know what you're doing and what you're saying. He said, well, back in Jerusalem, we have the opposite problem. He says, we know, but well, we're dead. You know, and their worship was dead. And they were dead in orthodoxy and, and what they were doing. But said, listen, he said, he wanted the true worshipers to worship the Father in spirit and in truth. It's so much like when the scripture says speaking the truth in love. You find those two extremes also, don't you? You have people that have the truth, and they get, they get the scripture right, they get the Bible right, but they have no love. And they're hard-nosed you know, legalists is what they are. You go down the road to another church, and I tell you, they love everybody, they receive everybody, and like the Corinthians, like Paul told the Corinthians, he said, yeah, you gladly receive anybody, that's the problem. You know, he said, you're, you're too open. He said, you're all love and no truth. And some people are all truth and no love, but somewhere in the beginning, speaking the truth in love and worshiping the Father in spirit and in truth. Really, the, the key to it is having the truth and being excited about it having the truth, and being excited about it. So, you know, the person is the Father. The place is in here. True worship. 
as you go, everywhere you go, you're a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him. And he said the purpose is why? Because the Father is seeking those to, to worship him. Because that's what God wants. So often we think that, that you know, the, the end of it is that God wants to bless us. God wants to bless us. God wants to bless me. And that's true. But, you know, there's the other side of that coin. God wants you to bless him. The problem is, is you don't see how you can. We really wonder, like, what, what can I, I wonder? Well, how am I going to bless God? How am I going to bless God? The fact is, is that you can. You know, the, I can only imagine if I could have given my little three or four year old daughter the intellectual mind of an adult, and she's there on the job site picking up blocks with me, and she knows, like, how is this really going to help my dad? This is ridiculous. And she didn't realize what a blessing that was to me. What a joy that was to me to, to see my daughter, to have her there, to have her doing something with me, to have that relationship with me. It didn't matter. I, I didn't care about her qualifications. I didn't care about her strength. I didn't care if she was in the middle of potty training and had a mistake yesterday. I was thrilled that she wanted to come to work with me and spend time with me, and take part in my work, and it was a blessing to me. That's a fact. Now, you don't think we can bless God? Does the scripture say in vain, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name? No, it is a fact, and it is true that God wants us to bless him, and that he gets something from our worship and our fellowship and our participation. What's the purpose of worship? To glorify Him, to bless Him, to serve Him, to do all those things, to go back to that original thing, you know, uh, I've got to go through Samaria. It's not convenient. I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, I'm wearied, sitting in the heat by the side of the thing. But, but listen, the purpose is, is to bless the Father. The Father seeketh such to worship Him. And He says in verse um, 24, God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. The woman said to Him, I know that Messiah is coming, He who is called Christ. And when that one comes, He will declare all things to us. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am He. And at that point His disciples came, and they marveled that He is speaking with a woman. Yet no one said, why, what do you seek, or why do you speak with her? So the woman left her water pot and went into the city and said to the man, Now you may think this is really insignificant, but I don't. Because the Gospels point this out numerous times in different situations, and that is the fact she left her water pot. Some people, when they were healed, they took up their bed. They wrapped that thing up. She left her water pot. Remember what she was thinking? i got to draw this water. And, you know, am I going to draw this water? Are you going to draw this water? How do we draw this water? No, forget that water. That's not what it's about. There's something else. There is a person here. There is another provision here. There is something greater than here. She forgot about that physical water pot. It wasn't about pulling water out of a 150-foot well that was dug hundreds of years earlier. It was about this person of Christ that she came to know. She left that water pot there. You read about the paralytic man that Jesus healed. He rolled up his bed and he put it away. But that old former thinking and former manner of life was, was no longer needed, was no longer there. And she went, she told him in verse 29, she said, come and see a man who told me all the things I have done. This is not the Christ, is he? Now I think maybe she was more marveled. That he knew all the things that she had done, and he still loved her. That he still wanted her. That, that he still was inviting her. That was the, the remarkable thing for me. That God fully knew me, but he still loved me. How could that be? I mean, I, I knew almost as much about me as God knew about me, and I didn't love me anymore. I thought I was pretty bad. I thought I was pretty wretched. And, and, and beyond all that, but, oh, her expression, though. He told me all the things that I've ever done. And I imagine all the local people in the village knew all the things she'd ever done too. And 
And they probably marveled at that, if y'all know what small town village is like. And he said in verse 30, she said in verse 30, they went out of the city and were coming to him. In the meanwhile, the disciples were requesting him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. The disciples, therefore, were saying to one another, no one brought him anything to eat, did he? And Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. He must needs go through Samaria. That's what's sustaining him. Oh, I wish that I was as concerned about but, you know, fulfilling God's desire and will for that day as I was getting my breakfast, lunch, and supper. I don't know how many of y'all skip things like that. Skip sleep, and I know maybe not of also really food-oriented. I'm pretty food-oriented, you know. I skip a couple meals, I start to get hungry. And uh, hangry, you know, hangry, you know. Start to get hangry. Or you miss a little bit of sleep, and, you know, you get grumpy, and, and we, we're so dearly looking out for our physical needs and desires. And, you know, I'm thirsty, I'm hungry, I'm sleepy, I'm tired, I'm all this. And, and if we could get that applied to the spiritual as well. Jesus said, I, I can't eat right now. This, this woman that I was ministering to is, is gone. I, I'm still, maybe he was still praying for her. Maybe he had in mind all the people that would be coming to him after and, and the ministry that was about to take place, but Jesus was more preoccupied with the spiritual than he was the physical, in so much that the spiritual overrode the physical. He said, I, I've got other things to do. Remember, Satan wanted him to use that power to, to satisfy himself. Hey, you're hungry, make these stones bread. He said, man shall not live by bread alone. He's got, i got some other stuff I'm living for right now. I got some other stuff that, that is preoccupying my mind, that I'm fixed on, that I'm, that I'm more concerned about than food. And I think he was trying to get his disciples to that point as well. And he said, that I've got food you don't know about. They wanted to know if somebody brought him food. And listen, verse 34, Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. He said, Do you not say... For there yet are four months, and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, that they are white for harvest. Jesus is saying, let's stop thinking about the hot dog and think spiritually. Stop thinking about, you know, 99-cent corn dogs at Sonic this afternoon, and, and think about the mission field that is before us in Samaria. He said, white with harvest. Was he right? Do you all remember in Acts what Philip did in Samaria? He was right, wasn't he? He was right, and he knew, and Jesus could look, and, and he had the, the, the spiritual perception to see what was going on, and he said, do you not say? It's hard for us to get that. Now, I grew up country boy, and I, and I understood. You know, as, as harvest was coming up, you're like, man, what's the rain going to do? Are we going to have time to harvest? Are we going to be able to bale hay? You know, are we going to be able to haul hay? Can we, if we bale it, can we get it out of the field? If we can get it out of the field, is it going to be too wet to put up? You know, and... And whatever it is, all the complications, and, and we knew it was coming, and we, we were watching for it, and we were making ourselves ready, and we were preparing and busy because we knew it was coming. He said, don't you do that? He said, can't you see? While you're preoccupied with food, can't you see the, the harvests around you, that, that there's opportunity to work and to serve? There's opportunity to work and to serve, and, and not only is there opportunity, listen, there's certain compensation. He said, verse 36, Already he who reaps is receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life. And he who sows and he who reaps rejoice together. Now listen, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether you're sprigging coastal hay out there or whether you are you know got a grain drill going through the field or whether you're on the combine crew that's coming through year, you know, uh, a couple months later. It doesn't matter what part of farming you're in. There's wages to be received. There's compensation, fruit for eternal life, is what he said. He said there is a reason and a reward for being preoccupied with the harvest. There's opportunity in front of you guys. Look. Look out there and see that there's opportunities like this woman at the well. Not only that, but there's, there's compensation for this too. It is worth it. Right? It is worth it to be, to be about the Father's business, is what he said. Not only that, you know, you're certainly compensation, and, and it doesn't matter if you're sowing or reaping. He goes down there, and verse 37, he says, For in this case, the saying is true, one sows 
and another reaps. He said in verse 38, I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored, and you have entered into their work. Now that's a hard thing. Sometimes we go and we work and work and work, and we don't see any fruit. I mean, don't, don't think that any work in Christ is in vain. You know, the trouble is, is we don't, you know, we, we share Christ with a hundred people and we see no result. We see Greg Laurie get up there and share Christ in one 20-minute session and, and a thousand people come to Christ. <laughs> we say, well, how now? It doesn't matter what part you have. It really doesn't matter. I can personally remember witnessing and sharing Christ with somebody and, and sharing Christ with somebody and then I watch them go to, you know, turn to Christ through another person. And as a very young Christian, I was like, Psh, what's up with that? It doesn't matter. Because I get, get no participation in, in the glory and that. The, the glorious thing was that they went to Christ. That's probably why God didn't let me to lead them to Christ, isn't it? That's probably why. He said, no, no, I'm just going to let you plant the seed. Somebody else is going to pull it up, right? You know, somebody else is going to, 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 to lead that person to Christ. And, but we, so, we get so preoccupied and so concerned that we can't see the fruition of our work. You know, I wrote a, an old note down in my Bible here a long time ago, and I put it very eloquently. I said, just shut up and work. Just shut up and work. You know, and well, God, I don't know, you know, and I don't feel, and I'm not sure. And it, he said, listen, one sows and another one reaps. And the important thing is that we're about the Father's business. It's not so important that you understand it. We don't need to understand it. You know, the wonderful thing about God being referred to as Father, we can all relate to Father. You know, we, we can all relate to Father. We, we can't understand His true nature. We can't understand the Trinity. We can't, you know, encompass the scope of work that he has going on. In fact, John said later in, in this gospel, he said, listen, if I were to write down everything that he was doing and that he's done, there's not enough room in this world to contain it. He said, stop trying to encapsulate it and understanding. Go to work. Go to work and be about his business. He said, don't you say that the time is coming to harvest? Don't you know that there's opportunities to work? Don't you know that there's compensation and a reward for working? Why don't you trust the Father that it's worth it to do it and just simply go and, and to do your part and to share or to serve or in whatever capacity it was and, and knowing that, that the Father seeketh such to worship Him? That's why. Truly, you know, we're not doing it for a response. We're doing it for the Father. If Isaiah had did it for a popular response, he would have stopped. Isaiah served the Father. If Jeremiah had, had worked for a positive response, he would have quit. And if Noah had worked for a positive response, he would have quit. But listen, they got to that point where they realized, listen, no, it's not a production. It's not a place. It's not, you know, any of those things. It is a relationship with this one that wants me to bless him, to serve him. And really, the, all I need to know is that I'm pleasing him, and that I'm serving him, and that's it. And I listen, I, I get to share in the rewards. I think of a man named Charles that I witnessed to, that I shared Christ with and, in San Antonio and over and over, and it was a couple years later, somebody called me and said, hey, guess what? I happened to go to church over at University Baptist. And I'm like, okay, well, and guess who else I saw there? Well, who? Charles. I'm like, Charles who? Who's Charles? You know, Charles, you, you remember Charles, you know? Uh, you know, the guy who cleaned carpets. And I was like, Charles? <laughs> yeah, Charles. I remember Charles. Did I have any idea that my work had gone to any? I had no idea. I, honestly, I, you know. Water into the bridge to me, not to God. That's just one that God chose to get the word back to me on, huh? Who knows how many, right? Let's just be faithful to share. Would you please stand? Lord, thank you for your provision.
and for your desire and care for us, for including us, for including us into your kingdom, into your work, and, and that you want us to participate and to have a place in this harvest that you talked about, in this work that you spoke of. Now, God, make us to be knowledgeable, to have that worship in truth, God. Lord, make us to be sensible and discerning of what your glory and reward is in order that we might have that spirit and that truth. And you said it was like water springing up into eternal life. That doesn't sound boring, God. And we want to know this thing, this service and this worship in spirit and in truth. We want to be about it. And Lord, I pray that you'd bless these. God, to be your witnesses. Lord, to be partakers of your spirit, both in and on, to be equipped by you. Father, with every gift for the edification of your church, Lord, for the evangelism of this world, God, for your glory and for your purpose. God, use us as your church and for your ministry here. And we're not experts, God. And you don't need experts, Lord. You just need servants. That's what we want to be. Lord, do it through us, according to your will and desire. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.